when you see that animal hop back and go off, you know, a little group of wallabies that you've raised go back to the wild or that eagle soaring off through the sky, it's just amazing. You, you just forget all about the hard work that's been into that, the sleepless nights and everything else, they just fade into the distance. Just seeing that animal go back to the wild and that's what I enjoy mostly. That's the tip of the iceberg for me, the release. This podcast series, Queensland Women, Inspiring Stories from Environmental Champions, gives voice to the vital environment support and ecological sustainability work undertaken by inspiring women practitioners, advocates and thought leaders in this state. We hope that it offers our audience and particularly women listeners energising ideas and encouraging role models which can help motivate them as they develop their own contributions toward building a genuinely sustainable future in this place. To be clear, that would be a future based upon much improved levels of human and other species health and well-being, much improved levels of social fairness and an authentic, sustainable economic prosperity which leaves no one behind. The series was produced for Hope Incorporated Australia in Toowoomba, Queensland, on and adjacent to the traditional lands of the Jarawa, Guyabal, Yugara and Waka Waka peoples of the surrounding region. Hope pays respect to the past, present and emerging leaders of all First Nation Australians in this country and celebrates the unique contributions their cultures make to this place. Those contributions include Indigenous spiritual respect and care for country, the sovereignty of which was never ceded. We acclaim Indigenous stewardship of the nature of Australia, undertaken over many, many thousands of years, and the model that stewardship provides us now in this place, as we survey and attempt to repair some of the environmental damage created by the often misguided development approaches of only the last 200 years or so. Hello and welcome. My name is Andrew Nicholson and I am the producer of the podcast series. The crucially important environment protection roles served by wildlife rescue, rehabilitation and education practitioners have only increased in recent years in Queensland, Australia nationally and in many other parts of the world. Almost everywhere around the planet, the ever-diminishing remnants of the natural world or habitat and the wildlife species they contain remain under constant further threat from impacts such as poorly planned urban and agricultural expansion. These trends have led to what has been termed by scientists the sixth species extinction crisis and unlike the previous five extinction crises, this one is being driven solely by human impacts. In the southeast corner of Queensland, the continuing trends of habitat and wildlife destruction are sadly all too evident and are well known to my guest in this episode of the podcast series, Trish Lahong. Over many years, Trish has worked within a variety of roles in wildlife protection, most recently from within the Wildlife Rehabilitation Centre she has created near the town of Toowoomba. Amongst many species of animal brought to the Centre for Rehabilitation from injury or even starvation, Trish is devoting time to koala rehabilitation and building an in-house facility to help improve the professional care for koala and other wildlife in this region. Trish's recent receipt of the Australian Wildlife Society Cerventi Conservation Award 2022 is only one of several official forms of recognition of her valuable contribution to wildlife conservation. So after that introduction, hello Trish, it's brilliant to talk with you today. Oh, hi Andy. Yeah, it is. It's a it's a great great day and a, and a really good topic, I think. So let's now move to the actual first question, you know, in time honored fashion for this series, um we ask each guest, well look, just how did you get into this interest, this passionate interest you have for environmental protection? The specific question is, do you remember how your passion for the environment started? Yes, um I, I do, actually. I, I was living out west. We'd moved out west for a month and um, decided to stay, love the environment, and um, set up a business. And then people came along with a few little animals. I've got children. I can look after animals. So um, we uh, were turned up with four little emu chicks, which I had no idea what to do with. And... Um, 
we went through a, a really long uh, process, which seemed like a long process, but it was actually only over a 24-hour to 48-hour period of, of ringing everybody that I could possibly think of. First off, you know, you ring the rangers and they don't know what to feed an animal because they're just supervisory, you know, they're a, a, an advice agency. And and then you ring the university because you know, you know, um, but at that time I didn't have any um, educational background, but, you know, they said ring the university, they have a flock of emus, they'll be able to tell you. Well, no. And then I rang a few zoos that were in Queensland and they didn't seem to know. So yeah, in the middle of all this turmoil in wandered one of our elderly uh, farmers, sheep farmer, and he just said in his own words, and these are his words, he said, listen, lovey, it's an emu. It eats meat and insects, just grab some meat, put it down its throat. So I did. And, yes, we raised the, the three healthy ones. The little one that was probably the latest one, last one hatched, didn't survive. But out of that, people were quite amazed to see these little um, emus running around and then came kangaroos and wallabies and a few other things, and it just grew. Um, and eventually um, I just became known as the local wildlife carer. Um, it was an interesting, a really interesting time in my life, I think, um, you know, having young children at the time uh, and not really knowing anything. I, I didn't have any animals as I was growing up. Um, I came from a very big family and and animals were uh, not included in in something that we had as a an extracurricular activity um, or anything to do with because you know when you've got nine siblings you know there's there's no money for looking after other animals um so yeah it was quite quite um an eye opener really on how how you know to go about caring for these little animals which is so different to caring for human babies yeah, fantastic to hear that. Just just for listeners who might be outside of Queensland, just to make this obvious point that we're talking here, when we're talking about going out west, we're talking about Western Queensland, a very large state on the eastern uh, seaboard of the, of the continent, sparsely populated out there. And, and the emu chicks, the story about the emu chicks, fantastic bird. I mean, just amazing. Um, I know as a layperson a little bit about it, but the very fact that, you know, just one thing about it, that the male takes over responsibility for raising the chicks is yes yes it is it's very interesting and, and that that was something that I, I I didn't even know about at the time that came later on down the track and we can we can talk about that in another question that you you have further into the series but um yeah it it they are such an amazing um creature absolutely um in in their behaviors and Excuse me for one minute, Andy. I've got a little Joey that's just popped out of the bag, and I've got to pick it up. It's pink. I think that's brilliant, uh, Trish. Just to make the point, yeah. we're, we're recording this. You're in your wildlife uh, rescue, care, and education, uh, I suppose, habitat. You know, you, the building that you work out of there. So you are tending to uh, various animals that you've got there at the moment. You made this reference to a Joey. Just again, for any listeners outside of Australia, we're talking here about a young kangaroo or a young wallaby or a young macropod uh, uh, to give it its technical term that you're caring for yeah um yeah young young wallaby yeah that they, they they hear movement and they think it's feed time so you know that's a it's actually a little pink wallaby so it doesn't have any any fur on its body just starting to get a little bit of fur on its head possibly around about four months old and feeding every four hours of the day and that four hours is coming up shortly so and brief very briefly i mean what's the story of that wallaby just to give the, the listeners a, a direct uh, intro into your yeah the mum was um hit on the road so she's come from um, roadkill and that that particular wallaby um was brought in by a lady that i met three days ago when i was doing a display um to raise funds to feed the, all these animals and it was a tiny little display, and she was interested being a a, a teacher, and um and and also a person who loves wildlife. And after a long conversation, she put her name down to volunteer, and 
you know, as things go, people get very emotional at the time of when they're seeing these little animals. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, oh, I'd love to volunteer, but two or three days down the track, it's it's past the event, and you don't expect to hear from them. But the very next day, she had um, gone off to to drop her children at school and was talking to a friend and uh, about what she'd seen and what I'd talked about you know if you see a wallaby on the road please check the pouch and and give me a call if it you know if, if it's injured and I can help that or if it's has a joey in the pouch um and the lady just said oh there's one being hit down the road why don't you go and check that so off she went to check it and there was a little live wallaby in the pouch so she jumped in the car and brought it down and spent the whole day with me even went off and bought supplies that I would have had to go out and get. She said, oh, you've got so much work here to do. I'll go and do that for you. So instead of this drop the animal off, which is usual, she spent, you know, I think about five hours here um, just watching what I do and helping with things that I do. So it was, it was quite an amazing little story, actually. Mm. Well, look, it's just that type of thing, that little vignette story that just gives uh, listeners a fantastic insight into what you do on a day to day basis. I just think just quickly that whole issue about, you know, community and citizen involvement in this type of work, the, the fact that at some level people are interested and are concerned about what happens to their native wildlife. I mean, I was just watching a superb documentary on ABC television in Australia yesterday about platypus conservation down in Hobart in Tasmania, southern state, and I'll perhaps put a link into that. And but to cut a long story short, you know, the, the real community interest when it was actually brought to their attention that these animals were managing to hang on in very suboptimal conditions in degraded um, creek environments down there in Hobart. But nonetheless, when the public were, um, you know, given a sort of intro into the risks and, and the sort of um, challenges these animals were facing, they did rally around as a group to attempt to try and improve the environmental quality of the creeks and streams there and help try and help the animals directly. So I think if, it, you know, the work you do is fantastic, tapping into that basic community and citizen interest in, in this work. Let's let's stay with you as the actual worker you are in your life, though. Um go back in time again um you know in terms of trying to do, keep a sort of like a, a chronology here is there anyone in particular you remember who inspired you or mentored you in your work you mentioned that very early bloke on the land that you know put you in direct touch with some techniques but other people well you know at the at the time it just seemed to be something that came to my attention to do so there wasn't anyone around me that really um, did inspire me um, to do what I was doing. Um, it was only, you know, later on down the track a little bit when um, when we built a wildlife park um, that I became aware of, you know, the ability to, to search because, remember, I was not academically educated at that time. It was just something that flowed on um, from what we were doing. and. And so it, 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 there were a couple of people in that instance that really did um, make a difference. One of them was happened to be uh, one of the people in the um, what was then the Department of um, Environment. And, and so he, just in the conversations with him about, you know, where to find information and 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 who I could possibly talk to, he gave me a bit more of an, a, a look on, you know, wildlife and, and how to go about finding information. And then when we did open that venture, one of the first tours that came through our little enterprise was a tour of Japanese researchers. And those Japanese researchers had been researching climate change for about 10 years. And they gave me information which was quite astounding to someone who knows virtually nothing about the environment and researching or anything else to say that in 50 years they believed that there would be no wildlife living outside an ecodome in Australia or on this planet. And that was 1994. And so I, you know, thought that's the strangest thing that I've 
ever heard because as a, as a lay person, you, you don't actually think about those sorts of things until you become really involved in how that affects every living thing on this planet. And so that, that was, they, they were probably the two groups of people that actually um, set my mind into thought and, and um, so that I could understand what I could do along my journey of looking after wildlife to not only help the wildlife that I was looking after, but also to help the environment that they lived in and to help educate other people who were interested in, you know, basic wildlife caring, but also in environment. And and I, I and I do think that is something that women are stronger in their personality with. And I think that comes that that is because of the nurturing gene. They're they're the 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 people that have to keep this thing alive traditionally the man's at work and yes he loves mm. his children don't be wrong he has input but he's not actually keeping a being alive and yet the woman the woman is she's feeding it she's nurturing it she's learning on how to do all this and I think in in that respect women are um possibly in you know in a broader spectrum um the stronger of the sexes in when it comes to um, uh, tenacity in, in, you know, keeping animals alive or keeping beings alive. You know, I look at humans as being animals. Hmm. People, people tell me they're all quite different, but, you know, I, th I think we're just one of the animals on this planet. Um, I couldn't agree more. And, I mean, I, again, I've just heard that, that, that quality of nurturance mentioned by the guests um, one guest had a lovely expression um, of bringing those sort of skills into making things happen, weaving social fabric. Mm. Again, you know, a, a, met a metaphorical, stereotypical um, skill that women supposedly of weaving have. But of course, you know, men can weave. But yeah. I just think, um, yeah. So and the other point coming back out of that last uh, comment you made was the Japanese, the fantastic anecdote about the Japanese researchers who along with other researchers, even 25 to 30 years ago, we're going back to the early 90s, understood, some people understood the pressing and urgent nature of climate disruption trends even then and where they were going to take us. And in fact, where they have taken us. Because, yeah. you know, now in 2023, I mean, some of the most recent stuff on biodiversity loss, I mean, at least now, there is a, a, a considered understanding of the very close connection between scientific understanding of the close connection between climate disruption and biodiversity loss. That recent um, UN level uh, meeting in Montreal last year, the 30 by 30 targets coming out of the Montreal Convention on Biodiversity, um, attempting to get a 30%, you know, saving on uh, biodiversity by 2030. Uh, but the understanding that we're in a race against time to do something yeah specifically significant on climate disruption otherwise we're not going to hit the biodiversity conservation target so those japanese researchers painting that dire picture but you know frankly and sadly all the subsequent research that's been coming out uh, seems to reinforce the message that they had and the understanding they had all that time ago yeah and i think i think that i i personally think that their figure was quite conservative because i mean they could not foresee the extrapolation or um the way in in which all our technology has progressed things so much quicker because mm. we wouldn't have been able to foresee the technology and the and and the changes that we have made to uh the planet at that time so you know i think i think 50 years from then was possibly quite conservative estimate yeah so trish i mean do you want to say anything about that topic of you know, the, the, the twin problems of climate disruption, biodiversity loss, where that's going at the moment, what the trend on that is, what, what's your estimation and what can we do about it? I mean, what's the what's what needs to happen to turn that around? Well, I think the biggest issue and, and this came out in a podcast that I uh, was looking at, you know, a month or so ago, maybe a couple of months ago, was that the biggest issue we have is human waste. You know, that's 51% of our greenhouse emissions. Humans need to stop doing what they're doing and go back to the old ways of, you know, 
recycling more and uh, protecting the planet more, going back to a state where they actually, uh, difficult to say, isn't it? You know, how did we do that in, in, in our day? We reused things. We didn't go out and buy something new every time it was a new fashion. We didn't go buy new, a new watch every year because the old one was out. We didn't go buy a new phone every year. The amount of waste on this planet is contributing so high, it eclipses all the industry emissions and everything else. And that's that's you see that everywhere. It doesn't matter where you go. This is a vast continent, Australia, and yet you can drive out and find takeaway in the middle of the outback. People have just cast it out the window or, you know, the rubbish tips are overflowing. Our rivers are overflowing. There's continents that are just dropping things into the ocean. We need as people, every individual on this planet needs to stop and think how they can do something, not leave it to someone else to do. It's not up to everybody else to do something. It's up to every person to do something. And, and I think that's the biggest thing that I think about and that's the one thing that I impress upon students and people that come to this place. If I can ask one person to do something, that's where my job is done or, or influence one person to do something because that that's two people doing something, me and someone else, if they can extrapolate that out. I, I think people don't think of the input and the damage that they are doing every single day of the week by waste and we need to stop waste because that's the biggest thing affecting this planet. Well, thanks for that, Trish. And now let's move back to your story arc, as it were, this personal story that you of your journey in environmental protection. Take us back to that early 90s period. We, You just referred to the Japanese researchers there, but I gather that's where some of your original on the ground work in conservation started when you started getting hands on so tell us a bit about that earlier time for you um well it was quite an exceptional time really i mean you know um just to build a wildlife park with no experience just the, the sheer thought of doing that now would actually make me quake but in those days um, it, it just seemed to be a progression. It was a, an idea. We were on the tourist route and having built the first deer farm west of the Great Divide, we then decided that, you know, um, be a good idea to expand and do a wildlife park and a deer farm. So that's what we did. And I think my knowledge grew much faster than I ever expected. Um, and it, it was a necessity, an absolute necessity to, um, to to even think about bringing these animals into uh, your care when you didn't have a lot of uh, information on that. But basic animal husbandry uh, is good common sense if, if that's the way uh, the trend that you are in. You know, for someone who doesn't handle animals and people well, um, I guess it would be really hard, but I just had a nurturing gene, I guess you'd say, and um, little animals seemed to thrive. And then when we brought the the, um, the other species in, um, they seemed to do reasonably well as well. We we had a different attitude, and I, well, I had a different attitude as to space that animals needed. So um, I was never one to put an animal in a little enclosure you know um, our, our two emus had five acres and and to me an emu is a big animal it runs 60 kilometers roughly an hour and it needs to be able to run and move about so that was my attitude that animals needed space they needed an environment that emulated where they would normally live in the wild and it, it was a very interesting time for me um, and, and no doubt very hard. Um, when you look back on it, amazing, absolutely amazing to have gone through that process. Difficult to leave 
Uh, but when I left there, I, I, I looked more into the broader side of the environment and, and what I could possibly do rather than just um, care for these animals and, and show them to people. I wanted to do more uh, for the animals that were in distress, and that's what brought me to caring for wildlife and and um, and, and interested in endangered species and the threat to the planet. So again, you know, perhaps in terms of that longer term view of the way people uh, advance a career, professional, vocational calling, you know, you, it seems to me that uh, you were building on that earlier experience. I mean, you know, the stuff you do now, you, you the fact that you can trace a lineage back to that earlier stuff, you know, that was back in the day, it was very challenging, but it was a formative time for you when you started honing some of your skills and then you actually extended that after you left that work, something like that, perhaps. Um, but coming now, yeah. would you agree? Oh, I would. And and had I not done that, I would never have ever thought of getting an education and doing that side of my life, which I still participate in. Um, I would never have dreamt of ever doing anything like that. I just thought I was just going to be a mum for the rest of my life and <laughs> And, you know, th and that in itself is, is a great attribute, but, you know, to have, to have gone to, you know, spent all that time going to university and getting an education from. From a basic, you know, 10th grade, um, it, you know, I think that it brought challenges to me and, and I just ran with those challenges. So perhaps, you know, one of the messages here, again, at a bigger picture level, again, this perhaps isn't surprising, but might be worth, you know, restating it in terms of a life philosophy is, you know, be adventurous, take calculated risks. I mean, push the envelope for yourself, particularly when you're younger, you know, you've got the energy and the sort of um, enthusiasm and the sort of uh, sense of, you know, the world is your oyster type of thing. Push the envelope, see where you might end up. In your case, that yeah. worked very well. Well, it was a it was a common comment that people made. Actually, uh, people that came through uh, our little wildlife centre, you know, they said, "Well, this is a big risk." You know, this is a little outback tourism's just starting to go. This is a big risk. You've put so much into this, and I thought, but if you don't risk something, you know whether you're going to. Uh, be what you're going to be challenged with in life, and you take that challenge. And if it if it fails, it, it's not the end of the world. You just get up again and do something else. Yeah. You know, it, to me, to me, it's just a natural thing. Just because you fail at something doesn't mean you're a failure as a person. It just means what you were doing could have been done in a different way, maybe, or yeah you know, who knows just a shame that you know in some ways that that personal philosophy which again i've heard you know at various levels within this podcast series uh couldn't be applied well and it is in very small pockets but couldn't be applied more um widely to our political system to our the great and good leaders that allegedly run the country in places like this uh, for them to be a bit more adventurous yeah. a bit more visionary in their approach take calculated risks in a good way of trying new innovative yeah. policies but anyway we can dream on um, coming back to the specific yes. interview, um, you know, coming now to your impact, to the the actual nature of the impact and your realisation about that, because I think, again, that idea of getting feedback about what we're doing, that is also very helpful. You know, are we hitting the mark? Are we getting there? So in your case, was there a specific moment in time when you first realised what impact your work was having in protecting or restoring the environment? Uh, I, I think I think that came... Um... When I a little when I was at university, um, because uh, there were the there was an attitude, there was an attitude that I was just a carer, you know, who just feeds animals and keeps them alive, and there's not really any great need for that sort of thing you know or, or any nobody puts great store in that um i myself put great store in that because it's an amazing thing to take a, an injured or orphaned animal and have it to survive and return back to the wild there's a lot of work goes into that um but 
you know, I, I think when I was at university and, you know, and after a little while I, where I was set aside as having no input, um, they started to realise that, yes, I actually did have some input and I, and, and, and I did have initiative and I was able to put forward scenarios to them as to, you know, different things that I'd learned and I'd observed through my um, previous, you know, five to seven years prior to going into that into that environment um, and, and was able to change people's attitudes slightly as to what was the importance of hands-on work in the environment, um, what did I learn from that. I taught them things about deer herds, for instance. You know, they were saying, oh, it's the stag who's the boss of that deer herd. Well, in my experience and of having five species of deer, it was the female. She would come out and she would stamp on the ground. And if she did that, the whole herd would come out to feed. But if she didn't and she walked away, nobody would come out and feed. And I think um, they doing things in and observing things more than book learning can sometimes put you one step ahead of what other people think is right and wrong. You know, I mean, we all learn things from our books and then we go out into the environment and do that. Is it true? Is it not? We often find that what we've read is not really con con uh, conducive as to what we find in the wild because what we read is sometimes on one or two incidences but what we we witness over year after year after year after generation of of raising animals and and watching that can be quite different and i think i i, I think acceptance in in a different way of learning and bringing that into that in university environment made a change for me it made them look at me as a person with worthy input which i hadn't had for you know, in, for quite some time. So it was, it was, um, it made, it just, well, it just made me feel like I was actually able to continue at university because prior to that, I was feeling like I, I just didn't fit because what I, what I had experienced and what I'd seen animals doing was not reflected in the literature. And then when you put that, into context and you say, well, this is what I've experienced, this is what I've seen, this is what happens, they start to document that and think about it. And that's, I think that's where my research interest came from. It's, um, I do work field work and um, field work is my, my most favourite thing, going out into the field and doing it rather than laboratory work, which I do a lot of as well. But um, to actually do that hands-on work um, to me is much more benefit for my, for my personality anyway. I think, uh, again, some interesting points out of that, you, you know, just going to that and almost at a, at a bigger picture level, the, the actual purpose of this podcast series in general, giving voice to women um, experts, women leaders, women thought leaders, women advocates, women change agents. I mean, you're talking there about that whole lack of initial acknowledgement of a particular person in, in in your case a woman you know coming into a, an expert academic field or whatever and saying hey you know i've i've witnessed this you know this research seems to be saying that there's a gap here and and who are you sort of thing that mentality of who are mm. you to be saying this and, and even you know in the scientific field we know this from you know the past history of science even robust research science can become ossified it can get stuck in a trench it can actually become um, self-justifying you know whereas the, the true spirit of science is constantly to be being questioned so the fact that you you found that yes. you know in terms of and and you were ultimately acknowledged because guess what you actually had some on the ground direct empirical experience that was useful and actually threw new light onto issues yeah so that arrogance yeah. almost of um, mm. an ossified knowledge base but look a fresh view being brought in by a woman that's another reason why we need more female voices across the board in a home. By yeah. a woman, I think it's by a woman with no academic experience. Yeah. If if I had been a woman who had degrees behind me or even high school level, 
uh, you know, grade 11, 12, you know, some background, they would have looked at me differently. But they knew that I was coming into this with no academic experience and therefore they gave no credence to my ability to Mm. be able to do things for them. And it wasn't until they decided that I'd be useful to them Mm. for open days and things like that to actually show people what to have these courses at university for because it was pretty Mm. new coming in. I came into wildlife science shortly after it began at that university and 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 then they realised the value of the living thing, mm. being able to observe a living thing and hear that story of how that animal is fed and how it's cared for and the temp- body temperatures and the times that you have to feed it and all these sorts of things. It actually brought reality to the course, mm. Um, mm. me and for a lot of students who, you know, uh, they're going to be lacking that now that they've taken work experience and those things out of the courses because, you know, I get students here now who have no idea about animal behaviour. It doesn't matter what you read in a book. You need to experience animal behaviour in its raw sense. Which you'd, you'd think after the, the, the long history of body of knowledge, you know, ethology or some ethology or something, but the study, the close yeah. study of behavior, it's not as if that stuff hasn't been around. I think this does go to a bigger picture issue of um, almost the philosophy of knowledge. You know, what knowledges are valid, what knowledges fit the actual frame of reference of the particular knowledge base or the scientific inquiry process what's justifiable you know but anyway that's a that's a topic for another podcast but i know also yeah. that you that you also as with other guests in this series you know the, the women um in this series bringing their particular skill sets leadership by example i remember you did make mention some anecdote about a an american volunteer who came into work with you back in the mid 2000s and then actually yeah. you know based on based on her experience your work went off uh, back to the states did you want to say something about about that particular you know people say oh they love what you do and it's fantastic and everything else and and what i do is fantastic and it, and it's a it's a great lifestyle but to uh, i also impress upon people that it's not for everybody and and you know you you need you need to be um to set some social boundaries, if you want to do a lot of environment work, um, you, you need to really hone in to do that. And, and there's different ways of doing that. So um, this young girl, she was she was just fascinated. She she watched everything I did, every little thing that I did, and I thought, oh, this this girl is gonna gonna do something. That was just my attitude when I spoke to her and. Um, Anyway, she I, I hadn't heard from her for a little bit and she said, I'm, I'm going to look into this. And she went back to America and, um, yes, yeah, she went to to school and talked about the trip that she'd had um, as with a little tour group that came through, the trip that she she didn't really got excited about. And, and she said, no, I'm going to do something for these animals and, and for animals throughout the world. So she did. She she made a little business and she made bracelets and she sold bracelets and they did some cooking and and they raised money for me um, to feed the animals and they raised money for other little environment groups and she went on to be a tour guide for that company and um, as as a volunteer because um, most of those tour guides are you know volunteers away from their own work. Um, and doing it um, out of their good heart. And uh, so she went off and did that, and uh, I believe she's still working in the environment industry, although I haven't heard from her for a couple of years. But, you know, there have been other students that have said, oh, I'm going to come back and see you. I'm going to come back and spend some time here. I've really enjoyed um, what what we, what we you do and the opportunity, the hands-on opportunity um to help these animals and believe me these these kids don't get much of actual handling the animals because it's against our rules to allow other people to handle animals so the work that they're doing is the external work basically i mean if um they're cleaning cages they're mowing lawns they're building enclosures they're being innovative and recycling 
um, things that have been given to me and building little huts for the animals out of it. Um, so, you know, they're not actually just sitting there feeding joeys and doing the things. That's, that's what I do. They get to observe that. They get to make the bottles and do that sort of thing. But they, you know, um, one one of the comments that I often get, and, and the last group through, I had only been here for a few hours and one of the students came in and said, this is better than the big zoo we went to yesterday. And it, and it's just because you can actually see what is needed to to keep these animals because it's totally different to zoo life. Zoo life is keeping animals alive and healthy and happy for people to see and to raise money for endangered species and, and other things, whereas this job is a thankless job, really. Um, you're always poor. Um, you're always tired. Um, but you 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 forget all that when you see that animal hop back and go off, you know, a little group of wallabies that you've raised go back to the wild or that eagle soaring off through the sky. It, it It's just amazing. You, you just forget all about the hard work that's been into that, the sleepless nights and everything else. They just fade into the distance. It's it, just seeing that animal go back to the wild, and that's what I enjoy mostly. That's the tip of the iceberg for me. The re- but I think we're also been talking here as we go through your personal story of work is the story of being an effective change agent, an environment support and um, protect practitioner, change agent, yeah. thought leader, educator, advocate. This is how you've you've done this. You know, for example, yeah. influencing influencing through example the passion that you've demonstrated to those people who have come into your orbit, like that student, like the other students, the interest of the practitioner, the contact with nature that they get in in a way that is probably unique for a lot of them. They've never had yeah. that hands on. As as with yourself, you you hadn't had it back in the day. They hadn't had it. So no. I just you know. Staying with that aspect of, you know, how how the change agent does this work, another aspect of this is the a, attempt or the ability to actually reflect occasionally, not resting on your laurels because you wouldn't do that, but the luxury mm-hmm. of reflecting on what you have built, what you have changed, what you have achieved as a sort of reinforcement mechanism, you know, basking in the golden glow of achievements from the point of view of that being a reinforcer occasionally a reinforcer to you say hey you know it is worth doing this so um tell us a little bit about that um you know coming to that idea of environmental protection achievements that you're particularly Mm -hmm. satisfied with what what are some of those achievements you've already mentioned some but what are some of them and why are you proud of of those particular achievements why um i i i think i i have been given some nice awards um for my work, and I've never applied for any of these things. And I think these have just been awarded um, to me for the work that I have done without me having to prove who I am or make any effort for that uh, process. And I think um, the the first time that I was actually publicly recognised for my work, was after the floods here um, and I had um, I4 come and the, they'd come to the region to help people and they couldn't find anywhere to, to uh, where these animals had gone. You know, they, they looked and went to a few places and nobody wanted to let them help. And when they rang me, I said, oh, no, no, I can, I can manage. I, you know, I can do this. Um, and they rang me back a few days later and they said, look, we've come to this region um, to help and nobody wants our help, you know. And I said, well, you know, I live in this little house. I've, I've got 100 animals. I've got no power. I've got no no anything. Um, and if you come here, you're going to have to leave your car down the bottom and you're going to have to walk in every day and walk out every day. Um, and they said, don't worry about that. We just want to help. So they came and helped and they stayed, you know, roughly about a week and then they went off and I never heard from them until, you know, maybe six months later when I got a call to say, hey, can you can you come to Brisbane? You know, we want you to meet someone or, you know, 
and um, and they didn't want to tell me what it was about. And um, and I said, look, I'm you know I'm really busy. Um, I, I'm not a society person. I don't like you know going out to a lot of do's and um, and meetings and forums unless it has a particular interest for me to to gain knowledge. And so I I didn't take much credence in that. And then they eventually said, look, we're we're going to bring someone out from America who wants to talk with you. And um, and I said, oh, yeah, okay, well, you know, if I can manage it, if I can find someone to look after the place. And and I had agreed that I would go and and then um, something happened and I, and I couldn't go. And, and she said, well, you know, we just wanted to tell you, you know, we have to tell you why we need you there and that's because we've nominated you for this I-4 award and this fellow's coming all the way out to award this. And there were seven awards throughout Australia that year um, for dedication to particular jobs, not necessarily for wildlife, but for uh, volunteering history and all sorts of stuff. And um, came the day I had a sick animal, I couldn't come. So I was um, very fortunate to have run a student that did her work experience here with me. She started a few days after the flood and she was the most exceptional um, student I think that I've ever had who just got in and did the job and she learned basic care, she learned media, um, she got to go out into the community and rescue both wildlife and domestic animals. She worked 10 days straight and She's and and I said, look, I, I would like you to be the person to go and collect this award for me. And her and another student who'd done work experience went and collected that award. And uh, and to me, that award and the w- award that I got earlier this year, they mean the world to me because I didn't ask for them. I didn't know anything about it. It's just people who have recognised my commitment and I don't have to talk about it with a lot of people. I don't have to go crazy and, you know, advertise thank you, thank you and all this kind of thing. It's just, um, to me, it's just acknowledgement that, hey, you've done something for the benefit of wildlife, for the benefit of the environment, and thank you for that. You know, um, because I'm such a private person, you know, personality, I'm not a society person, it really has to push me to go out into the environment, into the social environment um, to to do that because I've never been a very outgoing person. I, I don't ever want to be a speaker um, in, in the sense of, you know, a, a political person, I'm not going to tie myself to trees and do all those sort of things. But I do quietly work away at trying to make things better for wildlife. So they would probably be um, the things that I'm thankful for, the, the mess, which was the I4 Action Award in 2011 and, and recently the Australian Wildlife Society Serventi Conservation Award. Um, which was for 2022. Um, I, I had no knowledge of that. I actually thought it was a scam email, you know, and um, just ignored it um, until I recognised who it had come from and they rang me about that. But, um, you know, to me, looking back at the people that have been awarded that, that's one person in Australia once a year, um, they seem to have done amazing things, and I I don't see myself at that level. I just, it, it I don't know. It's not being humble. It's just being um, honest with you know how you feel about the impact that you have. You know, to me, the impact that I have is passed on from one person to one person. And it does actually take something like that to come into your life before you recognise that, hey, other people have talked about the impact that you have because um, you don't see it any other way, you know. I mean, we put things up on Facebook. Yes, we've released this koala. Other people put things up, oh, you know, Trisha's released this koala or she's saved this little echidna. But, um, yeah, recognition is is 
welcome, but sometimes, you know, for me, being a, a very private person, recognition can also have a different effect. Well, Trish, you know, whether you're whether you're a humble person or otherwise, I mean, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, the human as an animal. Uh, we are social animals is one particular view. And we do, as well, usually value social feedback, the recognition of our peers. It's interesting that, you know, this is clearly an important thing for you, private person though you are. This is one way that you get some validation, you know, in a society that doesn't value anywhere near enough um, wildlife caring, doesn't frankly value nature anywhere near enough um, to make a difference. Perhaps this is one way, albeit round through the back door, that we do get recognition for the very valuable work that people like yourself do. Hopefully we move to a time in society where there's a much more generic understanding yeah. of valuation. Uh, I was going to say, I kind of think, because this is a little grassroots place, to me it seems like it doesn't really have the effect of the big social um, entities, you know, like your zoos and your big wildlife parks and your big commercial places. This is not commercial. This runs on the smell of an oily rag. It's built from recycled uh, things mostly, um, and it just runs on hard labour. Uh, so. You know, to to me, possibly that's that's why it doesn't sit out there in the environment because it's not everyone's cup of tea. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Quite so. So, Trish, look, fascinating stuff. As we're going through this interview, we're coming, you know, further through it now towards the end. Um, look, for every guest in this series, we ask this same question. You know, what have been some of the challenges you faced in this environment support work you've been talking about? It's n n none of none of the guests have had a bed of roses. There's always challenges. There's always some degree of pushback. There's always some difficulties. In your particular case, how did you overcome those challenges? What lessons have you learned from the experience? Oh, what lessons have I learned? Um, I, I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is to be true to your own values. Um, to 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 do the best you can in the way that you feel is the right way to do things. To just keep going forward, and 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 if you come against an obstacle, you just look at it, work your way around it, or change direction. I, I don't have any any great. Um, business acumen to to uh, advise other people on how to do that, but I can only do that's the way I do things. I just look at a problem, try and solve it, and keep going forward. This is this is a almost a 24-hour day, and it is. Some days it's a 24-hour job. I'm nursing little animals that sometimes have to be fed every hour because they're so tiny and so fragile. And then I've got animals that get fed every two hours and animals that get fed every three hours. And, you know, over the last 30 years or so, I've learned that humans are adaptable and I'm adaptable to not needing so much sleep as most other uh, humans. How that affects me in the long run, I don't know, but it gets me through my day to know that I've done this for 30 years and I can cope with things that other people can't because they haven't done it on a regular basis. Um, so I work long hours. I'm always poor. I put all my resources into providing something better for the animals. Um, I live a very mediocre lifestyle, but it's rich in wildlife. Um, I just put my whole, all my energy and all my resources into providing for wildlife in the hope that I can get as many animals back out there, that my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, um, which actually do enjoy coming here uh, and, and being able to help me with the wildlife occasionally, I'd like to know that, you know, my footprint has a positive um, effect on at least some people to continue. You know, it, it, it really is um, a privilege to do what I do. Uh, it's not so easy. There's, there's laws and regulations and, and people who don't see the value in what you do, uh, but it, it is a privilege and, and I 
feel every day that I make a difference for those animals that are in my care. And I can only do a job of one person. So I don't ever expect that I'm going to change the world as such, but I can change the life for one animal every day. That animal can go back and live in the wild and breed. I don't know how many. Quite early um, when I came to this region, it was pointed out to me that what I do makes not one iota of difference to the demographics of wildlife in Australia. Understanding now how they work out demographics, you know, I, I do I do understand that. But I'm not thinking about that one animal that I'm looking after. I'm thinking about that animal that's going to raise more and their offspring are going to raise more and their offspring after that are going to raise more. If we can maintain this environment, think back to why I do this, uh, I do this because it's my passion, really. It, it's what I feel is worth doing in my life. It, it, it makes me feel like I've made a difference to an animal, to a species, to, to leave something behind, a footprint that is not actually attributed to me as a person but is something that they can see. Those wallabies might survive 10 years later. They might not. Who knows? But I've made an effort and the best effort I can make with the resources that I have uh, to make sure that I feel I've made my choice and I've done it for my benefit but also for the benefit of those animals. I do get joy from what I do. It's long hours, it's no sleep, there's no pay. There's that you know there's nothing that entices other people to come in to do this. Um but for me it's worthy and that's all that matters, you know, in, in the long run. Life's a challenge. We all take up a challenge from time to time. Mine's just extended over 30 years so far and I'm hoping that it's going to last for another 10 and you know I I would like to think um that my children and grandchildren and people that know me well would say well thanks for that and that's all there is I, it's just me um there are people that help me along in different ways from time to time uh but their attitude is I don't know how you do this. I can't do this myself. Um, you know, th they make no further comment. It's just something that they feel that they can't do. Uh, and I don't understand why. I think I think people can do more um, if they look at if they look at their life in a different way. Uh, in, instead of looking at it on a commercial society level and look at it as what can this one person do? And that one person can actually do a lot. You know, they can do an awful lot if you put your mind to it and if you're a, a fortunate enough to have um, worked your way through um, to learn, um, to to challenge yourself and to see the outcome is, it's mind-blowing, really. It It really is to think that, You've come from a person who knew nothing about animals and wildlife to being able to care for animals, to put them back in the wild, to educate young students, to educate old students. You know, we have older people that come in to learn to, you know, the things that you can do um, for animals, for wildlife. It's amazing if you want to do it. You just have to have a passion. Everybody needs their own passion. This is mine. It's my life challenge, and I am hopefully um, making the best of it. You've said a lot there, Trish. Um, it's an articulation of your working philosophy. I think that is an absolute key part of the interview. Yeah, I'm a simple person. I don't use fancy words. I'm a simple person, and I, mm. that's what people like about coming here. I have no airs and no graces. I'm a simple person. I ask them to do it how it needs to be done for the animal, not for 
humans to look at to be pretty. It doesn't need to be nice for humans to look at. It needs to be functional for animals. And that's one thing that is different for zoos and wildlife parks. They actually make things that look beautiful for people more so than what the animal actually needs. Uh, yeah, I, I see this every day in, in the carer in the care of thing. They they have all these pretty little things and, you know, lovely little colourful pouches and this and that and you know, and someone sent me someone sent me a picture of um would you like this for your possums? And it was a baby layette made with pretty pink bows and this and that and everything else, but with but it was, you know, possum bags and possum blankets. And I just looked at that and I thought, here's anthropomorphism to the mm. to the max. And I think, you know, going back to what you said, I mean, there, there's an example. You are selfless. You are ecocentric. I'm sorry to use a technical term. You're not anthropocentric. Um, you know, yeah. people, I think, in an in, in increasingly <laughs> human obsessed world, you just think of the screen culture, the selfie culture, whatever it is. You know, it's all about me, me, me as the um, yeah. a refreshing change to come to a person who is literally selfless to the point of view of more care for the natural world, more care for those um you know, natural beings in the world uh, than, you know, the usual average punter. I mean, it must be a refreshing change. But I just I just want to say that I personally, you know, you said you're a simple person, you know, you're you know, necessarily, necessarily a humble person or whatever. But I think that what you've just described, you know, you're articulating a working philosophy, the values that keep you striving to meet what I would consider to be genuinely heroic goals. I mean, heroism is a term that's thrown around superficially in our culture you think of the sporting ethos that uh, pervades our culture sporting heroes the nearest yeah. equivalent i can think to what you've just described is an athlete who devotes themselves you know single-mindedly to the achievement of a goal for what you know 5 10 15 years depending on the nature of this field they're in but at least those athletes mm -hmm. inverted commas are getting um recognition whereas someone like you with the same level of dedication yeah. if not more dedication is getting virtually no external recognition, but you don't you don't need that because you motivate yourself yeah. by your own self recognition. You know that what you're doing matters and counts. Yeah. So I, I I genuinely think your story is a heroic a heroic story. I think the I think the only difference between the athlete and and me is the athlete's doing it for himself, mm. and I'm doing it for wildlife yeah. and the environment. Mm. So our goal, our goal yeah. is to do the best we can do, but we're doing it for totally different reasons. What's necessary in my life is just to do the best I can do for this environment, whether it be for the animals, for the trees, whatever, conservation, you know. It's to do the best for a failing planet. Yeah. And that's what we have. We have a failing planet. You know, someone someone's got to maybe you know maybe one person will think think that that's just a ridiculous point of view, but you know maybe a lot of people will think it's a ridiculous point of view. But it's my point of view, you know. But also, you know, to behind that is the failing mindset that drives the failure of the planet. Yeah, it didn't get to this point by chance. It got there, but driven by us with this extractivist, destructive mindset of nature is simply a resource to be exploited it's not a respectful thing it's there for our benefit yeah that's what's really driven it yeah and it's not there for our benefit we've we've destroyed no. but now trish coming towards the end of this fantastic interview that we you know we've been all the way around the houses and back in terms of very creative discussion this is almost a silly question to ask you given the actual smorgasbord of work that you've described already but are you working on any current exciting projects one of the things uh, that is in the back of my mind was a simple question that was given to me by some japanese students and they said to me you know uh, we we can see from your work that you're working with a lot of more koalas now than you used to why is it that the australian people have not made the koala, their national icon. And I think their national treasure. And I couldn't answer them. I couldn't answer them why. 
the the koala, which is the most um, searched after animal. You know, when people come to Australia, they all want to see a koala. And yet we're not doing enough to protect our koalas. Our koalas have now come to be endangered. And why have we not in Australia made that our national treasure? National treasure puts that animal up onto a higher level. Um, it becomes more recognised. Uh, we need to put more funding into that koala, in, into that animal. Um, and, and equally so, a lot of animals that get to that. But, you know, there are a lot of endangered animals that don't bring forth the recognition like the koala does just because of its nature. I mean, we know why people love the koalas because of the way it just looks at you, the way the eyes just look straight ahead at you. It's a little bit like looking at yourself with a fuzzy skin on. Um, so I, I'm doing a lot a lot more koala work than I used to. I've built um, or trying to. I've, I've actually built the, the bones of a nice little facility here so that I, I can overcome some of the big obstacles that I've um, I have in living in the region where I live, and that is um, being able to bring the vet to the animals rather than the animals go to the vet because this is quite remote. You know, um, driving through traffic, you know, for a couple of hours with a with an animal that suffers from stress is not really the best thing to do. So, um, and it's been in my mind for you know over ten years or more that this is what I need to do for this region is to provide somewhere where this endangered species can be treated without putting more stress on that animal by, via transport because we know it suffers from stress-induced um, diseases. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm trying to raise funds um, to buy equipment for that. Um, I'm helping with some survey work. Um, and basically, basically uh, possibly we'll look more towards the endangered species in the future to, because they are something that does need a lot more input than what is being done for endangered species. So um, they're, that they would be the icon animal um, that I'm looking at. Uh, I still, you know, the animal I know most about, the echidna, is still even – Eclipses the koala when people come to my property. Um, they don't understand the echidna till they actually get up close and see it feeding and watch it digging in the ground and and talk about its senses, its sight, its hearing. They all sort of think it's just this little spiky thing that you know goes around, and then they learn that it lives for fifty years possibly, and that it only has maybe eight offspring and. And we lose so many of those because of the type of animal it is and the and the dangers that it that it poses uh, is quite cryptic. Uh, it has some innate behaviours, and uh, you know, uh, a lot more. If, if I'm doing a, a talk here, I, originally, it's, you know, they love to see the koala, but that's all they can do. They can just see it. But when when that comes to the echidna and you can put that on the ground and you can watch that walking and talk about the biology and and they can physically see that in movement, whereas the koala basically just sits up there and you look at it. Um, I, I think uh, you know pe people need to not only think about the status of an animal but also think about um, which animal can also attract the most support um, in education. Um, the koala is an icon. It should be our national treasure because it's what other people coming to this country want to see. But when they come to that country and they come to my place, they put more store and spend more time in looking at that tiny little spiky animal that, digs in the ground and, and disappear in a flash. And I think, um, so what am I looking at? I'm looking at two species um, that I can work with here, um, that I can talk about, that I can understand the biology of. 
uh, and I'm trying to make it better for those species to be accepted, but also just incorporating, you know, things that I do to make wildlife um, easier for me to look after in my um, older days, I guess, you know, making a nice little environment for wildlife and where I don't have to travel to get resources. We're planting trees, planting planting lots of trees for uh, koala, um, building a big exercise yard for koala so that when koalas have had a lot of time in hospital or in in confinement, they can then go out and climb the native trees and rebuild their muscle structure before they're actually put back out into the wild. Um, that's not something that the everyday um, koala carer can do, but fortunately I can do that where I live. And it's taken a long time. It's taken years to get this property to a stage where um, it's fully functional and will that I'll be able to manage um, with the help of a few people, hopefully. Um, yeah, I, I'm not doing anything great in other people's mind, I think, but in my mind I'm doing a lot. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything I can add to that, Andy. Okay, well, Trish, thank you for that. And the last, the very last question of this fantastic, stimulating and inspiring interview with you. Do you have any advice, especially for women who might want to step up into some form of wildlife protection, wildlife rescue um, work or other su environment support roles in the future? Do you have any sort of take home message for them? It is a, it's a natural process for women to be nurturing and they are therefore one step ahead of our male counterparts to do the job like I do for nurturing these animals, for taking the extra time uh, to consider putting more time into protecting the environment. To me, it's just a uh, no-brainer. You know, nothing, nothing comes to us without sacrifice. Sacrifice a little bit of the time and use your expertise in some way to help it's where we're women we're women women just have what what we what they need you know we ha we have that passion and we have that nurturing ability so you know we're a, of a species one half of the species that does that job just follow your passion and see where it leads Female nurturance, values and skills being brought to the environmental protection role. Trish, an uplifting thought to close this inspiring, genuinely inspiring interview. It's been a real delight to talk with you today. I'm sure you've given our audience some great ideas which will help inform their own thinking about possible next steps toward building a genuine, ecologically sustainable future in this place. For instance, through starting their own conversations on for example, wildlife carer or environmental protection topics we mentioned with their friends, families, colleagues, within employing organisations or in their professional associations. But for now, Trish, on behalf of my podcast support organisation, Householders Options to Protect the Environment, I should like to thank you so very, very much for our discussion today. Thank you. You've been listening to a podcast episode in the series Queensland Women, Inspiring Stories from Environmental Champions. The series was produced for Householders Options to Protect the Environment Incorporated as part of the Queensland Women's Week 2023 event and it aligns with the objectives of the Queensland Women's Strategy 2022-2027. Hope thanks the Queensland Department of Justice and Attorney General's Office for Women and Violence Prevention for the generous funding support which made this podcast project possible. Please consult the episode text notes for possible follow-up material on topics discussed and any relevant contact details should you wish to respond to anything you've heard. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider promoting it across your networks and giving it a positive rating in your preferred podcast app. My name is Andrew Nicholson, producer of the series, and thank you for listening. <laughs>